Thank you for joining today's webinar on the Kauffman Foundation's newly launched grant making strategy. We're thrilled to have you here as we walk through the key components of this initiative designed to close economic mobility gaps and position Kansas City as a national leader in equitable growth by 2035. We have developed a strategy that drives toward closing the economic mobility gaps in the Kansas City region. And we believe with focus and in collaboration with you all that we can close the economic gaps that persist in our community, particularly for those living far below the medium income in, in the Kansas City region. The why behind our priorities is simple yet powerful. We are committed, we are committed to closing economic mobility gaps for the most underserved communities. So what do we mean by Kansas City region? We mean the following six counties, Cass County, Clay, Jackson, Johnson, Platt, and Wyandotte counties, where I am from. Does this mean that, they, that you have to be an organization located in these six counties to apply for our opportunities? No, it doesn't mean that. The only requirements are that your organization's activities or your proposal's activities align with our strategic priorities and focus areas and that they are activities that have the potential for impact in the Kansas City region. So our speakers today are my dear colleague, Allison Greenwood Bajracharya, Chief Impact and Strategy Officer, and myself, Dr. Yvonne Owens Ferguson, Chief Research Learning and Evaluation Officer. So here's a quick overview of today's agenda. So I'll begin with an overview of our strategic refresh, including insights from our community conversations. And then Allison will delve into the details of our grant making relaunch. She'll cover our new philosophy and the focus areas for grant making. She will also take you through the various grant types and pathways available under our new strategy. Finally, I'll share how we are approaching metrics to track impact and reporting requirements for the grants that opened today. I'll also share information on our grant making community outreach efforts, including key dates and resources to help you engage with us. And then we'll end by answering your questions. Our strategic refresh is the culmination of extensive research and community engagement. We want to ensure that our approach not only honors the legacy of our founder, Ewing Marion Kaufman, but also reflects the needs and aspirations of our community today. So we began this process by engaging with a wide range of stakeholders across Kansas City. And I know you may have seen our president and CEO, Dr. D'Angela Burns Wallace, in the community over the past year. Well, during that time, we've been gathering insights, reflecting on our previous work, and considering how we can be more effective in driving economic mobility. So we didn't develop these strategic priorities in isolation. We conducted a series of community conversations to gather feedback from you all, to learn from the people who know Kansas City best, its residents. Our community conversations gave us the opportunity to hear from folks in the field what questions and concerns they had and where they felt we could add value. So during the past year, Dr. Burns Wallace spent hours listening and engaging along with other Kaufman leadership and the feedback we received was invaluable. This feedback has shaped every aspect of this strategic refresh. We heard loud and clear that people want more than just resources. They want a foundation that is engaged, responsive, and deeply connected to the community. Our vision is clear. By 2035, we want to see a Kansas City where everyone has the opportunity to thrive regardless of their background. And to achieve this, we've identified three strategic priorities. College access and completion, where we want to ensure that more students not only enroll in college, but also complete their degrees. Workforce and career development, to connect people with the skills and opportunities needed to succeed in today's job market. And of course, entrepreneurship to support new and existing businesses that can drive economic growth and job creation. 
So now I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Allison, who will talk about our grant making relaunch. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, hello again, everyone. I'm Allison Greenwood Bhattacharya, Chief Impact and Strategy Officer here at the Kauffman Foundation. It's basically a fancy way of saying I get to oversee all of our grant making. And it's really thrilling to be here. Um, this is our third webinar. It's just, it's, it's so exciting to see so many people show up and, and learn with us. So since we launched our strategic priorities this spring, um, we spent the last couple of months clarifying our focus areas, developing new grant making pathways and aligning on how we will track our impact. Our grant making will focus on four key areas. First, essential competencies and skills equipping individuals with the mindsets, behaviors, and skills needed to succeed in both school and career. An example of this could be mentoring or coaching, particularly if it is integrated into the job or real world learning experience. Our second focus area is education and employer connection, strengthening ties between education providers and employers to ensure that our workforce is prepared and relevant. An example of this could be innovative pathway, pathways from school to employment. The third is participation and belonging. We know it's not enough just to ensure people have access to great schools and training and workforce opportunities. We want to ensure that we're cultivating environments where everyone feels seen, valued, and able to contribute, regardless of their background. An example of this could be initiatives that focus on not only creating access, but supporting continued engagement and advancement in college, work, or business ownership. Finally, we have equitable access. And what we mean by this is really making learning pathways affordable and capital accessible to all learners, workers, and entrepreneurs. This could look like, for example, an intermediary lender focused on minority-owned businesses. I will be giving a high-level overview of the grants uh, shortly, but all this information, including more examples, are included on our website at kaufman.org front slash funding. Organizations can and do have multiple focus areas. Uh, we encourage organizations that work across multiple strategic priority areas and focus areas to think about where, um, where their needs are greatest as they explore our grant making opportunities. So in addition to developing our focus areas, we thought a lot about our grant making philosophy. Our new philosophy both informed the pathways we're gonna talk about in a minute and will also inform how we approach exploring and uh, the due diligence process and our grant making opportunities. So our new philosophy is grounded in four key principles. The first one, proximity to community. We're committed to staying close to the communities we serve, ensuring that our work is informed by their experiences and needs. Two, getting uncomfortable. We're willing to take risks and address tough challenges head on. This means embracing innovation and being open to new approaches, even when these new approaches push us out of our comfort zones. Achieving impact, where leads are focused on driving meaningful, measurable results. Everything we do is aimed at creating real lasting change. And finally, creating hope. Through, re through research-driven innovation and collaboration with change makers, we aim to foster hope in the communities we serve and in which you operate. So with these focus areas and our philosophy in, in this new strategy, we're offering several types of grants to meet a range of needs. I'm going to walk through each of these at a high level, but this is a lot of information, excuse me, a lot of information, um, and there's more details on our website, uh, and we will have specific webinars focused on each of these as well if you want to go deeper on each. So to start, we have capacity building grants. These are designed to help organizations strengthen their internal operations so they can have a greater impact. Applications are open now and extend through October 8th. Second opportunity that's currently open is our collective impact grants. These are for coalitions of high capacity organizations that are working together to drive systems level change. We're particularly interested in projects related to education and employer connection, as well as equ equitable access. Applications are also open currently. It's a two-part application. So the first application is a planning grant, um, and those are due November 1, and that will be a nine-month planning grant process before the final uh, applications are due. Next, we have project grants. These provide funding for specific projects that align with our strategic priorities, whether it's a new initiative or the scaling of an existing one. Letters of interest for these project grants open October 15th. 
Additionally, on October 15th, letters of interest will open for research grants. We're looking to support research that deepens our understanding of the issues we're addressing and translates findings into practical solutions. Finally, we have sunset grants. These are available to previous grantees with projects that are winding down and no longer align with our current priorities. This one-time funding will help uh, organizations transition to new sources or bring closure to your work. Applications are open today and extend all the way through March 31st, 2025. Additionally, we're launching an Uncommon Leadership Award. This will be, uh, more information will be forthcoming in January. This award will honor leaders who are making a significant impact in the Kansas City uh, region through innovative, generous, and meaningful work. We will be hosting webinars, as I mentioned, um, specific to collective impact, project, and research grants in the coming weeks. So if you haven't already signed up and you're interested in learning more, please do so, or please sign up for upcoming office hours starting next week. Here are some additional details regarding our grants in terms of the funding amount, the windows that open when they close, when funds are dispersed, and the frequency. I also want to clarify a few questions that have come up about our grant ma making pathways. First, a very common question we've received is, can you apply for multiple grants? So organizations should identify the grant that most cl closely aligns with your specific needs and focus on a single grant application. We recognize there are larger institutions that may have multiple decisions, or excuse me, divisions within their organization that function like autonomous entities. We will consider multiple grant applications from organizations like that. The other except, exception is organizations that are part of a collective impact coalition and are not the lead applicant. Those organizations may choose to apply for an organization specific grant outside of the collective impact application. That being said, the default assumption should be that you should only apply for one grant at a time. We really encourage you to think about which one uh, most reflects your most urgent needs as you think about impact and our vision of creating of ensuring that Kansas City is a model for equitable economic impact by 2035. The next question we're getting quite often is, do you have to be a 501c3? So you are not required to be a 501c3 organization to apply. Legally, for-profit organizations can apply for projects that have a charitable purpose. If you need more guidance, please email us directly. Many people also ask whether the foundation funds political advocacy or political activity, excuse me, political activity or advocacy. We do fund strategic advocacy, education, and other policy engagement activities that do not con constitute lobbying or political activity. Uh, we cannot fund lobbying or elections activity. All right, I know there are many more questions to come. I'm going to first pass it back to Yvonne to talk about metrics, and we'll come back to your questions after that. Yvonne. Thanks, Allison. So as Allison mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, reporting and metrics. I'm going to share how research, learning, and evaluation will intersect with our grant-making approach. So overall, the aim is to catalyze the grant making strategy and also facilitate and communicate grantee learnings. And throughout our strategic refresh process, we leverage research and data to guide our decision making around strategic priorities and our focus areas that Allison talked about. We selected priorities that are evidence-based drivers of economic mobility, and we selected focus areas that are also evidence-based drivers of our strategic priorities. That said, we are launching this strategy knowing that we don't have all the answers. We must engage with community to build a greater and deeper understanding of what closes economic mobility gaps. But we are excited and continue to be excited about collaborating with researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and community members to ask questions test hypotheses, and really dig deeper into our focus areas and build a collective understanding of what drives outcomes. Our approach to evaluation and grant making is collaborative learning. This slide mirrors the questions around metrics and the expectations around reporting that are communicated in the application portal, which as you know, is now open. So in the application, you will see we have selected applicants to tell us if they are collecting specific economic mobility metrics and to share additional metrics they collect and track. 
We ask these questions, not because we're asking you to report on these metrics, but to learn from and understand how organizations aligned with our strategic priorities are tracking their impact. If you do not collect these metrics, that is perfectly fine. Again, if you do not collect these metrics now, that is perfectly fine. Again, we ask these questions around metrics and the application in the spirit of collaborative learning. Next, you'll see on this slide our expectations around reporting. These expectations are specific to the grant pathways listed here. So for the sunset grants, no reporting is expected. For capacity grants, we are asking grantees to report on the development of the specific organizational capacity they were funded to build and how that capacity facilitated the organization's ability to achieve their goals. Now for collective impact planning grantees, the research learning and evaluation team will collaborate with grantees to develop an evaluation plan during that planning period. The expected deliverable at the end of the planning period will be an implementation plan that includes this evaluation plan. So again, for these collective impact planning grantees, the research, learning, and evaluation team will work collaborative, collaboratively with you. So now that I've given a high-level overview of our grant-making strategy, Allison provided that, it's now time for our Q&A. But before we get to that, we know we cannot answer all the questions today. We've been getting a lot of questions. Um, so we have added additional webinars and have also scheduled office hours for, um, for you. And so you can see that listed on this slide. Please note that your participation at a webinar is not required to apply. So you do not have to participate in a webinar or an office hour to apply for our grant app opportunities. These are optional opportunities for you to learn more. And you can always visit our website listed here, kaufman.org slash funding. And from here, we'll move into the Q&A. Please feel free to use that Q&A chat and we'll answer as many questions as possible. Okay. Allison, are you with me? I'm with you. Okay. And I'm noticing certain things here. Number one is I'm squinting because I forgot to put my glasses on. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now I'm in business. Okay. So one of the, um, there's been several questions around geography and specifically, what does it mean? Are applicant, can you only be an organization um, inside Kansas City to apply for these opportunities or can you be located outside of Kansas City for these opportunities? Allison, I'll pass it to you for that one. Thanks, Yvonne. So we're getting this question quite a bit. I wanna just ground us in our why. So our vision for 2035 is that uh, Kansas City will be a national model for equitable economic mobility. And so we know that in order to do that, we have to put an emphasis on impact in Kansas City. If you're not based in Kansas City, that is okay, as long as you are aligned with our priority, priority areas, our focus areas, and demonstrate a current or potential opportunity to impact equitable economic mobility in Kansas City. Awesome. Okay, we have another um, question about our strategic priorities, specifically around entrepreneurship. Uh, will the foundation still place a high value on supporting entrepreneurship? And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> we believe in the power of entrepreneurship. Um, the success of the businesses of strengthening our economy is around entrepreneurship and small business. And our legacy surrounds Mr. K, who was a businessman um, and found and really thought that and knows that business ownership is key to economic mobility. So the foundation will continue to emphasize supporting pathways for equi equitable economic mobility through business ownership. Um, and I will see if, Allison, you want to add additional aspects to that question. No, I, I mean, I think you said that very well. Congratulations. Um, I, you know, entrepreneurship is one of our three priorities. So it has always been a priority and it will continue to be a priority for the reasons uh, Yvonne stated. 
Um, we are especially thinking about entrepreneurship in the context of our fo four focus areas and also in drawing connections to workforce um, and also uh, access to and completion of um, college. So thinking about connections in those spaces across our priority areas and across our focus areas are especially important. Thank you, Allison. Um, here's another question around the specific type of organizations can, that can apply. Um, and Allison, you mentioned um, some of this in your remarks during the webinar. Um, are we um, able to fund or, or what is the type of organization that we can fund? Are for-profits eligible to be funded? Um, can you be a project that has a fiscal sponsor and still apply for our opportunities? All right, so this is a um, a somewhat complex response, so bear with me. Uh, but the majority of our grantees are 501c3s. All of our grantees must demonstrate um, that the work we are supporting is for charitable purposes. So there are some exceptions, um, including private institutions, um, or excuse me, for-profit institutions that are pursuing charitable purposes. Um, historically, this has happened in entrepreneurship space when we're looking at access to capital and alternative ways to support entrepreneurs. Um, and so there are some exceptions. Uh, those generally happen through program-related investments, which would take place through a project grant or a collective impact grant. So if you are not a 501c3 and you are interested in funding for charitable purposes, um, and this makes some sense, but not a lot of sense. I encourage you to reach out via our email and we can follow up and, and get sort of into the context in which you're operating so we can get you a more precise answer. Um, but more or less, the answer is potentially. Thank you, Allison. Okay. If you guys see me squinting, it's because I'm really trying to see these questions because they're coming in fast and furious. Oh, here's a metrics question. I guess that one's for me. Um, metric support. Um, will there be any metrics, um, support for metrics for organizations um, from um, officers? And so the answer to that is yes, but it depends on the grant pathway. Um, as we mentioned before about the different types of grant pathways, uh, grant making pathways, there are certain um, grants that don't require any reporting, and there's some in which uh, there is going to be reporting involved. It depends on the grant. So for example, the collective impact planning grantees, that would be something where uh, evaluation and learning officer would work collaboratively with the grantee in terms of developing those metrics, because we want to make sure in terms of metrics, does it make sense to the project? We're not just collecting metrics for metrics sake. It has to be, um, it has to make sense. And so there will be support provided, but it depends on the grant pathway. Okay, another question. Oh, um, there's another question about sponsorships. Uh, does this mean that we are no longer funding event sponsorships? No, it doesn't mean that. That is quite the contrary. We're still providing event sponsorships and have updated our sponsorship page to help provide a greater clarity on the process through sponsorship guidelines and an eligibility quiz. So again, sponsorships must also align with our strategic priorities. Um, and I'll ask if someone from the team can maybe, I guess you all have been putting links in the chat, but maybe put a link around um, opportunities in terms of the language around sponsorships. Okay. Another question. Oh, can you describe um, the application? How long does it take to complete? Um, how extensive is it? I'll, I'll pass that one to you, Allison. <laughs> Thanks, Yvonne. Um, so I'll just start with, uh, I was a former Kaufman grantee, so I've, I've been through the previous application process. Um, and I'd say in some instances, this application is simpler and some it's more extensive. And so it probably depends on your, your previous experience. We really try to develop questions um, that are only relevant to our, again, our, and deepening our understanding of what you're trying to achieve. Um, so the questions are, are deeply aligned with 
what information we need to assess alignment with our priorities, our focus areas, how you're thinking about impact and the capacity you have to achieve your, your bold, ambitious visions. Um, sunset grant application is very, very simple. Um, the rest of the applications start with an eligibility quiz, and that's just to help ensure that you are aligned enough um, as an organization type and with our priorities and focus areas that you should proceed. That eligibility quiz should take about five minutes. Um, the capacity grant application is a, a little more comprehensive than the sunset grant, but I think it has about six questions, again, really focusing on um, your leadership of your organization, your um, experience in this space specifically related to economic mobility, um, and then what you're trying to build in regards to capacity. As Yvonne alluded to, the metrics are pretty simple. We just want to understand what the outcome is going to be as a result. Um, project application uh, that actually starts with a letter of interest and same with research. Those letters of interest will open October 15th. They will be rolling and twice a year we will review those and ask a group to move forward in the application. That application process is still intended to be relatively simple, but will probably take a little bit longer, again, because these are multi-year grants for larger amounts of funding. So there's just a, a little bit more information we need to understand um, to assess viability. And then finally, um, the planning grant application is the first of two parts for collective impact. And so the planning grant application, again, is a little deeper, more detailed because we will understand who's leading the coalition, what is their capacity for convening, for serving as a fiscal agent, for building trust in the community, um, who else are they likely to engage? And then once the planning grant is um, awarded, uh, the ultimate plan will be much more comprehensive because that will lead to a, a multi-year, much larger scale funding opportunity. So the application time varies depending on the grant. Again, we focused on simplicity. We'll be curious and eager to get your feedback on how we can make it even simpler moving forward. Um, and we encourage you to start with the eligibility quiz just to make sure you're thinking through alignment um, really thoughtfully ahead of time. Awesome. Thank you for that thorough um, response, Allison. <laughs> um, this, uh, this webinar is being recorded. So again, you will have access to um, to this webinar afterwards if um, folks didn't catch everything or you want to share with your colleagues or team. Um, there's a question around research. So ooh, I'm excited about this. Lots of questions around research. So the research um, opportunities are aligned in a sense with the project, uh, project grants that Allison spoke about in terms of when they will be, um, the cycle in which they will be. So there will be a letter of interest around the um, research grants, and that will be on a rolling basis. They, those um, opportunities in terms of a grant team will be twice. Um, I think we have two cycles for that. Um, understand that those are not available. So the research projects and also um, the research grants and the uh, project grants, those will come out by October uh, 15th, and we will have more specifics around what we're asking. Um, for the research grants, I can give you a sneak peek around our goal in terms of 2035 to close, and how will we close economic mobility um, gaps? So um, just to give you a broad sense of where we're coming from on um, thinking about questions. So if you're not, there's questions around, do you have to be located in Kansas City to apply for the research grants? No, you do not. Um, if you have a proposal that maybe it has um, nationwide impact, maybe it has local impact, we want to get from whatever um, research uh, projects how we can have potential impact or maybe inform our Kansas City region in terms of closing economic uh, mobility gaps. So again, you don't have to be an organization or a research institution located in Kansas City to be eligible for that opportunity. Okay. Yvonne, I'm sorry. I thought of um, one PS I'd like to add to the application. Okay, go ahead, please. <laughs> Um, so we do, in most of the applications, ask about the communities you're serving. We ask some specific demographics questions. If you do not have the answers, we do not want you to go down a rabbit hole to make up the answers. Um, this is really just so we can grow a deeper understanding of 
who you all are serving, how that aligns with our vision um, for impact across the six county region and closing equi economic mobility gaps. So I say that out loud now, um, it is in print, but I just want you to know we are serious about that. If you have um, data you can share, fantastic. If you don't, and you can speak in broad brushstrokes, fantastic, um, but you do not need to go find data you don't currently track. Thank you, Allison. Oh, here, here's a question around the upcoming office hours. How should people uh, prepare for the office hours? Will I be able to have specific proposal ideas um, answered during these office hours? What kind of setting will it be? Good question. I'll start and I'll have Allison really talk about that. Um, our upcoming office hours, one thing that will be um, uh, beneficial for those that are attending is to really go through our website and understand the different grant pathways. Um, so you can be more um, prepared and specific about the questions that you have during that time. There will be um, uh, impact officers during those office hours to be able to answer questions. But again, one, one thing you can do is just make sure you've read all of our information um, so you can be prepared in terms of what kind of questions you would like to ask. Allison, you have more to add on that? Sure. Yeah. These, these office hours are really intended to ensure you have the information you need to then go make an informed decision about which application to pursue. So they are not intended to be a one-on-one -on -one can you help provide feedback and wordsmith this application? That's that is definitely not the um, expectation we want to set. So I want to be clear about that. But they are intended to make sure we're getting a lot of information out. We know we're sharing a lot now. There's a lot on our website, but it takes a while to process, especially because this is a different process and different um, opportunities than we've presented in the past. So if you are looking through our FAQs or you're looking through the grant making pathways and you're like, I just don't understand what this means or how should I think about capacity versus project or um, it, where does my coalition need to be in evolution as I'm thinking about collective impact, you know, you can come and ask those questions. But if you're thinking about like, should I, I have this idea, does it sound better for capacity or project? We're not going to answer that for you. We're going to give you as much information as we have, but we really want, we're looking to you for the answers. We're not leading with the answers here. So this next question blends in well with um, when you're talking about project grants. Can you talk more about what you mean by um, multi-year funding possibility? Um, also, will you offer grants to sustain programming? I'll pass that to you, Allison. Sure. So project grants are intended to be um, multi-year and larger scale than capacity uh, because we're, we're hoping to see a larger opportunity for impact. So we know some for, for some organizations, that means actually leveraging resources to take an idea that's already been tested, but to design the next iteration and then figure out how to scale or grow that. Um, for others, it might, it might look like um, expanding a program um, to multiple counties within the Kansas City area. For others, it might mean doing a landscape analysis, doing community engagement, and then working on implementation. Um, so we recognize organizations are in different places in their evolution as they think about large-scale impact, and we want to present this as an opportunity. So you could ultimately say you're interested in a two-year grant or a three-year grant, um, and the idea is that it would start with $250,000 a year and be at least multiple years. I hope that helps. Awesome. Um, thank you for that, Allison. Uh, here's here's a, a question around the capacity building um, grant opportunities. Um, is there a minimum number of people served slash impacted for the capacity building? Um, well, they say and project grants, so either or. Is there a multi-year funding opportunity for the capacity building grants? And is the capacity building reporting uh, can you explain that a little bit more? So I will I will start with the reporting, and then if you can talk about the people served and the multi-year funding component of it, we can answer it that way. Okay, in terms of reporting, um, we want to see and understand and have evidence that you said you were building capacity around um, what you said intended intended to do from the outset. We want to know. Um, for example, 
if it was to build capacity. And I'm just saying this because I'm a research evaluator. If you want to build capacity around evaluation, that would be something that we would want to know if you did or did not do. So the reporting is not um, as intensive as I'm going to say it's not intensive as you would think. We just want to know if you did what you said you were going to do and was capacity built around that. Um, I will pass it to Allison for the people impacted, served, and also the multi-year funding in terms of capacity building. Thanks, Yvonne. So the notion behind capacity building grants are really recognizing there are so many assets in the Kansas City region focused on impact um, especially as it relates to achieving equitable economic mobility. But there are organizations who want to build their capacity so they can even have even greater impact. That could press that capacity could look look like somebody um, supporting uh, a leader of an organization to take a sabbatical, supporting a leadership training, leadership team in new training, bringing on salesforce capacity. It could look like bringing on short-term support to help build, boost fundraising and build a fundraising campaign in a website. I mean, it really is very broad. And so we're using that the, the term capacity broadly for that reason. We want to understand how do you need to grow your capacity so that you can increase uh, impact when it comes to economic mobility in Kansas City. That's a long one way of saying we don't have a specific um, target uh, number of pop number of people served in mind. We're really looking to you as a, a trusted entity on the ground. Um, who is your community, and how do you want to grow capacity so you can grow impact within that community? Um, generally, we assume most of these grants will be, be about one year in length. That being said, if you ultimately need the money to to roll out over two or three years, you can indicate that in the application, and that is okay. Um, but our hope is that these are shorter term capacity needs that will then position you for longer term impact and other opportunities with within the grant making pathways. Thank you, Allison. Okay, here's a question that we have received um, many times: What don't we fund? Allison, I'll pass that over to you. What don't we fund? Um, I mean, that is a complicated question. <laughs> so, you know, what we do fund is easier to say. Uh, organizations, again, that are focused on impact in Kansas City that are aligned with our priority areas and um, focus areas. We don't support capital projects. We don't support projects that are discriminatory in nature. We don't support um, funding that goes directly to an individual. So we, we're not going to um, provide grants directly for a scholarship. If there's an organization that's applying for funding to then give scholarships, we can do that. Um, you know, if if your organization's priorities are not aligned with ours, then we, uh, you know, encourage you to look towards other foundations. Um, but we are really intending to try to cast a wide net, and we've created multiple grant-making pathways, recognizing there's so many organizations in the space that we want to be able to support doing high-impact work, um, and we need to meet you where you are in different entry points. You know, if you are a small or new organization and our grant size is bigger than anything you've ever um, received or larger than your existing budget, we probably aren't the right foundation for you, but we are supporting organizations that are closer to the ground and can support you better. Um, and to add to that, uh, and you mentioned this before, we do not fund lobby lobbying or political activities. Um, we don't fund um, brick and mortar. So building buildings, that's not something we fund. We don't fund endowments. Um, and there's probably additional things. That was a, that was a great question. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Yvonne. And the eligibility quiz will help get at all those specifics. And so you can go on again, it's like a five minute at most quiz. Um, and if for some reason, you know, you were thinking, oh, they would support me with this capital project, that'll help flag that that is not, um, the, that is not where you should be spending your time with us. Right. Okay. We, we continue to get more um, geography questions. Um, could we um, reiterate where we are focused on? I'm going to go in, um, when we talk about the Kansas City region, go back to naming the six counties that we mentioned, and they can put that in the chat as well. Um, we can also 
uh, the six counties is our Kansas City region. And again, people are asking um, if we fund approaches inside or outside of Kansas City. The important thing is, again, focusing our 2035 goal is closing economic mobility gaps in the Kansas City region. So that's really what we're foregrounding is the Kansas City region. However, if your project has potential to impact the Kansas City region, we also want to know those in terms of the learnings that we can um, that we can maybe apply or adapt to the Kansas City region. So again, if you're a national organization, you can apply. If you're an organization outside of Kansas City, you can't apply. Um, but again, we want to see what type of what are, you are proposing, um, what the greater intent of focusing on closing economic mobility gaps in the Kansas City region. Uh, Allison, please add to that. I think you nailed it. Oh, okay. All right. Um, another question around, oh, are we able to apply for multiple grants? I'll pass that to you. <laughs> Thanks. I'm I'm laughing because I like to find simplicity on the other side of complexity, but this is somewhere in between. So generally, um, organizations should only apply for one grant at a time. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, so if you are a large organization or institution that has multiple divisions doing distinct work related to our vision, um, then you are able to apply for multiple grants at a time. If you are an organization that is part of a coalition that is applying for the collective impact grant, but you are not the lead entity, then you can also apply for an additional grant. But generally the default position is please only apply for one grant at a time. Okay, thank you for that. Yep. So questions are still coming in, but there's they're slowing down a little bit. Oh, um, are there specific focus areas for collective impact grants? So I'm going to remind how Allison described around not only the strategic priorities, but also the focus areas that were listed there. Um, so please revisit um, the website for and this recording for those specific areas um, we identified in terms of our, our focus. Um, but Allison, I want to turn it over to you to see if you wanna add anything in terms of the collective impact uh, planning grants and are there specific focus areas? Yeah, I think the easiest way to think about the collective impact grant is we really wanna see coalitions coming together to address systemic barriers. And we know that to create systemic change, to get to equitable economic mobility, um, two of our priority areas really stand out. So the first is education to employer alignment, and the second is equitable access. So we encourage collective impact applicants to really center on those priority areas. If you also wanna speak to our other two priority, excuse me, focus areas, that's fantastic. But those are the two where we're really emphasizing uh, a need and opportunity. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another part of the research uh, questions that have come in that I don't think I can't remember if I answered it or not, so I'm going to say it again. Is there a date when the research projects will be, um, the RFP will be launched? Um, it's October 15th. Um, that's when the portal will be open to receive letters of interest. Again, letters of interest will be on a rolling basis for that. If you are an academic research or institution that is outside of the Kansas City region, you, again, that does not limit you. You can apply. Um, we're looking for basically strong proposals around um, our research projects. I think they put in the chat also that there will be both webinars for the research projects and for the, pro the project grants and the research grants. And when those are available, uh, we will send out things on our social medias and also our website to let um, folks know when you can register for those. Um, okay. I'm squinting because I'm trying to read. So bear with me, be patient. You're doing a great job, Yvonne. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the support. Um, there's, an, uh, there's another question around um, 
from K through 12 partners? Can school districts be included in partnerships? Any school district that is thinking about access and completion of college, workforce and career and entrepreneurship aligned with our focus areas should absolutely be considered and, and should explore grant making opportunities on their own, but also in the collective impact opportunity. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a reiteration of the counties because I only I think I only mentioned Wyandotte because I'm from Wyandotte. However, the other six counties, Cass, Clay, Jackson, Johnson, Platt, and of course Wyandotte. Okay. So there is another question, and we'll we have we have time for about two two more questions. Um, there's a question around geography keeps coming up. So I'll reiterate what geography, um, again, we're focused on not only those, we're closing economic mobility gaps in the Kansas City region. That's kind of where we're foregrounded. That's our North Star is around that. Um, if you are an organization outside of Kansas City, you are welcome to apply. Um, yeah, you're welcome to apply. Here's another question around how we'll evaluate the applications. Um, could you talk more about how the panel will review um, or applications will be selected for funding? Um, maybe talk about the scoring rubric. Alice, I'm going to pass that one to you. Sure. So we've designed uh, a review process that is both intended to be collaborative and calibrative uh, within our team. So we'll have multiple impact officers review every application and then um, bring recommendations to the team that will then bring them for a larger review. Um, we're really looking for alignment with our priority areas and focus areas, um, alignment with impact, um, what the what the outcomes you're thinking about are, and opportunity for learning collaboratively with us. Um, and I can add a little bit to that, that um, we are really being intentional um, in terms of, along the lines of what Allison said, in terms of um, the calibration and the collaboration, um, also, we want to make sure that the process is rigorous. So we're going to have multiple impact officers um, review the application, and they're going to go through um, a, a internal process. And we are trying to make it um, to be holistic, in a sense. There will also be opportunities where um, for expert review, specifically around the research proposals. Um, that is one part of the process in terms of um, in terms of selection of those that will be funded for for the research projects. That's the one I'm talking about. Yvonne, that's true for collective impact as well. So we'll okay, bring collective impact. experts okay. for collective impact and research. We're trying to balance both um, rigor and the need to move quickly, recognizing that um, most likely grantees are eager to leverage dollars and move quickly because. That is how our world works, and we, you all are doing really ambitious, exciting work and are eager to make even more impact. Um, with capacity building in particular, our deadline is October 8th so that we can uh, review applications quickly and make some grants as soon as this year. So um, that is the intent behind the deadlines. We've also very intentionally laid out what our windows are throughout the year so you can be mindful of you know what makes most sense given your fiscal year, given other revenue streams, given where you are with capacity and thinking about impact. So we are really trying to meet you where you are um, for the project and collective impact and research grants. We may have follow-up questions, and if so, we will be in touch. Um, but you'll hopefully experience a process that is reflective of the questions we asked and um, one that is indicative of wanting to move quickly and responsibly to get to impact. So um, this is our last question because we're um, running toward our time, um, but it, Allison, it um, blends into what you just mentioned about collective impact. For the, could you describe more about the collective impact um, grant coalition idea and um, how they would be, um, how they are structured to um, assess impact? 
I guess it's around like how, how are they organized? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so the collective impact, um, you know, it went live last week and the deadline is November 1st. So we know that is also relatively quick, um, especially for coalitions to move. So we're really looking for existing coalitions or coalitions that have been emerging and sort of circling around ideas um, and using this as an opportunity to coalesce even, coalesce even more clearly on what your vision is. Um, we know that coalitions will not be um, fully composed uh, before the planning application. And so we're looking for the lead applicant to speak to who loosely who are coalition members and who else do you plan to engage and how do you plan to engage stakeholders and community and be really mindful of input and feedback that'll ultimately inform your planning process. So the application will speak to questions that um, recognize you may not be fully informed about where you're going yet, but you have a vision, you have um, a sense of who your stakeholders are, who your coalition partners are, and then through the planning process, the nine-month planning process, if you're awarding the planning grant, you'll have much more time and support and partnership in developing that into something much more robust. Uh, and to add to that, um, again, with the goal of closing economic mobility gaps, um, the deliverable is an implementation plan. So you're planning for that nine month phase that um, Allison spoke about. And then the phase, if your project moves forward is around implementation. And during that planning phase, uh, we want to incorporate evaluation from the start of your collective impact grant. And so uh, again, we'll be working with you um, to design and think about an evaluation plan that will um, um, be, you know, go in hand in hand with your implementation plan. So again, just something more to think about in terms of the collective impact planning um, grant phase. Okay, so we are coming up toward the end. I'm trying to see if I, if there's one more question that is just burning the people backstage that are helping us <laughs> with this. Is there anything that is particularly burning? Um, one more question. Yvonne, while you're exploring that, I'll just remind everyone, again, these webinars are not required. We're really grateful for your time and your interest in your questions today. If you have additional questions, feel free to sign up for one of the upcoming webinars or come to office hours. Again, having done your research and re reading through our website, um, but we are we are hopeful that we can get you as much information as possible so that you can make an informed and excited decision about how to pursue our grant making opportunities. All right, awesome. So uh, let's go back to our slides. If we didn't get to your questions, and we got to most of them today, I have to say, Allison, we got through a lot of questions. But if we did not answer your questions, don't worry. Um, again, those opportunities for additional webinars and office hours are on our website. So please uh, register for those. And we want to thank you again for coming to this specific webinar, which will be recorded that you can watch and share uh, with your teams and colleagues. So those are the um, office hours and the uh, remaining webinars that are available. And please, please, please register for them. Um, other than that, we want to both thank you on behalf of um, Dr. D'Angela Burns Wallace, um, Allison, and I would like to thank you for coming to our webinar. And we are excited to um, see applications rolling in because the grant portal is now open. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Yvonne.